Okay, so our next speaker today is Norm Lifshitz and he's going to tell us about hyperconductivity for global functions. So take it away, Norm. I'm going to talk about um, hyperconductivity for global functions and its applications to extremal combinatorics. Um, okay. The main problem in extremal combinatorics, we are given some finite space X of objects and want to understand what is the largest subset of X that uh, satisfies the restrictions. So we have some restriction on subsets and want to understand what is the extremal set, the largest set that satisfies the restrictions. For example, as we mentioned, uh, we have this notion of an intersecting family. Okay, so, family F is intersecting. The intersection of each two sets in the family is non empty. Okay, so this is the example for K equal to two, where we have and um, this set is not intersecting because it has two disjoint edges. And here we have the trivial intersecting family, the dictator of all edges that contain a given vertex. And here we have an intersecting family that's not containing a dictator. And uh, that's uh, the notion. And uh, the Erdos Corrado theorem that we uh, mentioned earlier says that the extremal intersecting families are the dictators. And this is basically the philosophy of the erdos corrado theorem, that if you want to, um, sometimes when you have extremal problems, the trivial solution is actually the largest one. Um, and uh, this erdos corrado uh, theorem, it started a subfield of extremal combinatorics of a whole variety of extremal problems where the extremal sol solutions were conjectured to be uh, dictators. So, um, let's say a little bit more about it. Yes, yeah, so Kostochka. They um, found this notion of this class of external problems called Turin problems for expansion. Um, And uh, okay. these these included um, these included some open problems from the seventies. Uh, where the extreme solution was conjectured to be a dictator. The extremal solution was conjectured either to be a dictator actually or a dictator or a junta. And uh, okay, let's give like a sample problem, so there is this 1975 Erdeshosh forbidden intersection problem. Uh, 
um, any tasks. How large a family of set B? If the intersection of each two sets in F is not of a given size. This problem has relations to coding theory, and um, this is one uh, sample problem where the ex extremal solution was conjectured to be a junta. You can take the family of all sets um, that contain one up to t. This is a uh, so t plus one in that range. Let's let's call it t minus one just to make it uh, nicer. Okay, and uh, so this is one extremal solution, and there is also another uh, for some range of the parameters. There is another extremal solution, and um, we can take a set of the family of all sets that whose intersection with one up to t plus two r. This is at least uh, t plus r. Is another a uh, another example of a family that satisfies this condition that the intersection of each two sets in the family is not of size uh, t minus one. And ah yes, so um yeah now the, the screen trick doesn't work. Okay. This, <laughs> Yes, I have this family of all A such that the intersection of A with this two R is at least T plus R. That's an example of a T intersecting uh, intersecting family. So the intersection of each two sets in the family is not a size T minus one, and actually the intersection of each two sets in the family is a size at least T. Okay, and th these problems were studied first for families of sets, but they were also uh, studied in algebraic combinatorics where, uh, where they are studied over groups. And each time when we try to solve this problem uh, for a different group, you, it involves the representation theory of this group and, uh, and it motivates um, a lot of nice representation theory and, uh, and Okay. We'll not talk about that. Okay, so okay, so, so we have this family is called juntas and dictators. So Boolean functions can also be thought of as like voting schemes. When we have to choose between two options, we have a, a, let's say pizza or ice cream, and then we have the dictatorship a function where we choose what one person decides. And we also have the junta example, where we only uh, three people determine what we eat. This is a free junta. And it turns out that uh, this junta method, it, uh, so is some method that helps solve this erdos quadratic type problem. So it's not only a method that, that's helpful in uh, Boolean functions and in social choice, it's also helpful in extremal combinatorics. Um, and, and indeed what we managed to show time I lose the pen. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so what we proved so Alice Keller and and me we proved that um, 
Yeah, so we basically uh, solved the Erdeshoz forbidden intersection problem. for some range of the parameters, so it's for most values of k. So it's for k at least 40, most um, half minus epsilon times n. When k is larger than half, this problem, this problem doesn't make any sense. And, and it's sufficiently large with respect to epsilon and t. And the main notion that uh, we used was this notion of juntas. So what are juntas for families of sets? Um, a family is a junta. If we want to understand whether a set belongs to the family, we can throw away all the elements of A into the garbage instead of the junta coordinates and just look at A, the intersection of A with J, and based on that, decide whether uh, A belongs to the family or not. So for example, we can take um, the set of all A in F such that one is in A. This is a dictator. And we can also take the set of A in F such that the intersection of A with the set one to three is at least two. This is an example of a three junta. And this is uh, an intersecting free junta. This family is an intersecting family. The intersection of each two sets in F is non empty. And what uh, uh, Dinur and Friedrich showed is they show that every intersecting family is essentially contained in, in an intersecting junta. So that's the structure of all the intersecting families. If I want to construct an intersecting family, I can start with an intersecting junta. And then I can always remove elements from the intersecting junta and it will still be intersecting. And then I'm, I can only add a few elements outside of the junta. And that's basically the structure of all the intersecting families. And as mentioned, we, um, uh, with uh, Nathan Keller, we developed the junta method. And we used it to, to show for, that for this, class of problems that I didn't define of this two one problems for expansion, you can show that, uh, that for these extremal problems, all the solutions are essentially contained in juntas. And also whenever the extremal solution is a dictator, we were able to prove it. This allowed us to make progress on various open problems from the seventies. So let's summarize what we had so far. So we talked about uh, extremal problems. We talked about the erdos quadro theorem that says that the largest intersecting family is a dictator. And uh, we talked about this field of erdos quadro type theorems where we want to show that the extremal solution to uh, an extremal problem is a dictator. We also talked about this junta method that helps solve this erdos quadro type uh, problems. Before I talk about it, I'll, um, I want just to mention a little bit more about, uh, about the proof. Um, and uh, I want to explain the role of uh, hyperconductivity for global functions in these results. So basically what uh, the Dinur and Friedrich method was, the idea was to um, decompose an uh, intersecting F To uh, pseudo random parts, which they called uncapturable. Let's define these. What are these uncapturable parts? 
So F is R epsilon capturable. There exists R dictators. Um, let's call them DI1 up to DIR. So these are the families of all sets that contain, uh, this is the family of all sets that contain I1, such that F is essentially contained in their union. So if we take F and count how many elements does it have outside of the reunion, we get almost nothing. This is at most epsilon times the size of F. And uh, yeah, I don't know how much control you have over this, but is there any way? Uh, the, I, I can't see the writing. I can I can read it. Yeah, I, mean, I can. I guess if this is. Okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. We said it. Okay. So, 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 um, okay. So, family is capturable if it's almost contained the union of a small amount of dictators. And then basically what I showed is that if we take, um, if I have F1 and F2 that are one capturable parts of F, so we decompose F into one capturable parts. So if we have two uncapturable parts, we can find in F1, B in F2 with, um, with the intersection of A and B non empty. So this is um, similar to the regularity method in additive combinatorics, where you decompose uh, a set into pseudo random parts. And then you have this uh, counting lemma where you want, you want to analyze these pseudo random parts and to show uh, that they contain your. Uh, they contain many of your forbidden configurations. So that was their idea. And our additional idea was instead of decomposing into uncapturable parts, we decompose into global parts. And decomposes, um, okay, so. It's basically similar to, uh, in, to what happened in doorstock when you have these restrictions that each of these uh, is uh, uncapturable. In their case, in our case, it's uh, global. Yeah. I don't want to be too formal with it, but the main, their main idea was to decompose into uncapturable parts and we further decompose into global parts. And as I mentioned yesterday, was it yesterday or two days ago? Two days ago. <laughs> and, uh, as I mentioned two days ago, when you uh, have a global family, a global function, you can, you can get back the level D inequality. And, uh, and then you get exponentially better Erdos Corrado type theorem. And that's what uh, makes this decomposition into global parts together with the hypercontractivity uh, for global functions, it makes the combination uh, very powerful. So, so basically, if you have a, a global part, gives you a level D inequality. And then you get exponentially better uh, Erdos Corrado type theorems for the global parts.
Does it make it work with computer? <laughs> or I can just break the computer. <laughs> Do we still need the slides? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the slides need to be in there, though. Like, you can all see those boards, right? I'll see the sideboards, right? Ah, maybe I should just write on the sideboard. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, anyways. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but, anyways, what, what's written here is that we have these, we decompose into global parts, we get a, a better level D inequality, and then um, because the noise operator kills the low, the high degrees, and uh, we can apply this level D inequalities to get exponentially better at the squad with type theorems. And now we're going to switch from uh, extremal combinatorics to additive, additive combinatorics in group theory, where we have this problem of product free sets in groups. And so in group theory, you have th this problem of, uh, okay, so. Usually people care about subgroups where the product of each two elements in uh, the subgroup is inside, but we will care about the opposite thing where the product of each two elements in the set is outside of the set. Um, but this problem actually has some uh, applications to growth in groups and things uh, that even group theorists care about. So. <laughs> okay. um, uh, so, okay, so a set is product free if the product of each two elements in A is not in A. And the extremal problem corresponding to this notion is how large can a product free set be? So, so I'm asking you to solve the, the, the case where this, the group is the symmetric group. Find the So in Sn, you have the sign homomorphism from Sn to plus minus one. And then if you take the one permutation such that the sign is minus one, the odd permutation, then the product of each two permutations with sign of minus one is going to be of sign one. So this is a a product free set. On the other hand, if A is a subset of uh, SN, uh, is, if A is a subset of SN that's product free, and G is in A, then A intersection with GA uh, is empty. The intersection is empty. So the intersection is empty. That's, this means that uh, A plus GA, this is at most n factorial. So the size of A needs to be at most n factorial over two. So this means that this product free set is the largest product free set. That's for SN. Are there any questions? Okay. So now let's move on to this problem in 
uh, an, and, and this problem was posed by um, Baba and Shosh in 1985. And so it's concerns this problem in the alternating group. And Ben Green is a list of 100 favorite open problems. And this was problem number four in that list. And for us, the appeal was that the conjectured extremal uh, set for this problem is somewhat of a dictator. So it looks like problems from uh, methods from Boolean functions might be relevant for this problem. Okay, so, so what are the dictators in the alternating group? So if we want to check whether a permutation belongs to the dictator, we have to check just one element. This is like one notion of a dictator. And the dictators are basically these guys. So they're uh, defined as the set of permutations that send one to a set i. And they said that the external product three sets are dictators. But that's not exactly true because um, it's easy to show that you can come up with two permutations that send one to i, but the product doesn't send one to i. There is no reason why the product should send one to i. But after a small modification, the dictators are what it's for. So we define this uh, dictator of all permutations sending i to i. You can make it product free by adding the extra condition that the set i is sent to its complement. And this set fii is actually product free. So if we have, so if sigma of one is in i and tau of i is uh, in the complement of i, then and tau sigma of one is not in i. So if sigma and tau belong to the to this family FII, this product free dictator, then the product doesn't belong to the dictator. Uh, so the best i to take is root n. And then the condition that one is sent to i happens with probability one over root n. And the other condition that i is sent to its complement, this happens with a constant probability. So it's really essentially a dictator. I is should be of roughly of size uh, root n. Okay. Um, and Gowers found this uh, really nice proof that the example product is set in a and the size at most n to the minus uh, third, a density at most n to the minus third. And um, this was improved by Heberhard to uh, n to the minus one half up to log n to the uh, seven. So this is like, this O tilde is like log n to the seven half times factorial. Uh, and we uh, managed to show the exact extremal result. So for insufficiently large, the extremal set takes the form and it's the extremal set is this product predicator of all elements that send i to i and also send i to i complement. Are there any questions about uh, the results? So let's talk a bit about uh, Gauss proof. This proof is really nice. Okay, 
this proof is really about uh, pseudo-randomness in uh, Kelly graph. And uh, also about the Hoffman bound. So if we have, um, we have a, a, a graph, yes. it's independence number. Let's, let's say mark the maximum of uh, I divided by G. All independence at I. This is at most the minimal eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix divided by one minus lambda min of the adjacency matrix. That's uh, the Hoffman bound. And Gowers uh, had this observation that if you have a product free set, it's an independent set in the Kelly graph that has A as a set of generators. So if we have an edge A1, A A2, and that with A1 in A and A A2 in A, and also A is in A, then we get that A is not a product free set. And so that's why this set A needs to be independent in the Kelly graph. And then you can apply the Hoffman bound. So if you get a good bound of the eigenvalues of, of G, you can get uh, that the independent sets need to be very small. But, but usually when you try to compute the Hoffman bound, you have a given graph at your disposal and then you can do something to compute its eigenvalues. But here we have an arbitrary Kelly graph and Gauss needed to come up with some ways to upper bound its eigenvalues. And uh, what Gauss showed is not, is not only that the minimal eigenvalue is small in absolute values, but actually that this graph is pseudo-random and um, it's, it has a, it's a good expander, essentially. So how did Gauss uh, prove that? Yes, one idea was this Hoffman bound and the other idea The other idea is the trace method. So we have this notion, um, we have two no notions that seem to contradict. One notion is symmetry, and the other notion is pseudo randomness. And uh, they seem to contradict each other. But actually, Gauss' ob observation was that you can use symmetry to deduce pseudo randomness. These Kelly graphs are very symmetric, and they have the, the whole, they have the full SN as the symmetric, as their set of symmetries. And you can use the trace method to deduce that these Kelly graphs must be pseudo random. And the idea is quite simple. So what he did was he looked at this uh, adjacency matrix of this operator, the normalized one. So we have this operator T uh, such that TF of sigma is the expectation over A in A of FA sigma. What you said? For every function, okay. So if we have a function s uh, in L two of S n, we can define this operator that corresponds to um, this Kelly graph. This averaging operator that corresponds to this Kelly graph, and then if we take a look at t star t f of sigma, this is like taking a the expectation over um, a 
at a in a and a prime in a inverse and taking a f of a prime a sigma and then you can compute the trace of t star t so what's that this is the probability after normalization so we can it's n factorial times the probability um, that if you take two steps of the random walk one for a and one for its inverse you reach to the same place so this happens with probability one over the size of a you have to, when you choose a prime it has to be exactly a inverse in order for this in order for it to reach the same element you get this n factorial divided by two times the size of a on the other hand this is the sum of a okay, okay so so let's assume for simplicity that uh, t star is equal to t just for simplicity and then we'll get that this is the sum of uh, over all the eigenvalues in the spectrum of t of the multiplicity of lambda times lambda squared. So from this we get that uh, if m lambda, if the multiplicity is large, then lambda must be small. But we have this sum that's equal to this number. So the larger the multiplicity, the smaller the eigenvalue is. And then you can use the representation theory of SN to say that this M lambda, it must be large for, for, uh, for every function that's not the constant function, this M lambda needs to be at least N minus one. And that's how Gauss got his uh, upper bound on product three sets. And this result, it uses uh, the second eigenvalue. It only uses the, uh, uh, the second smallest multiplicity of a high dimensional representation. Uh, but actually, for SN, you have, uh, you have a similar decomposition into degrees like you have in the Boolean cube. And the higher the degrees, the higher this m lambda is. So, so we know that large m lambda implies that lambda is small. We can decompose the space L2 of Sn as a direct sum of the spaces V equal to D, where V equal to D is like in Max's stock. It's the sum of all, you, you take all the functions of degree D that are orthogonal to all functions of degree D minus one. And the function of degree D is if it's a linear combination of D juntas. We have this decomposition uh, into the greedy functions and inside v equal to the m lambda is much is larger it's like um, is roughly let's say n to the d so the, and that's follows from the representation theory of the symmetry group the minimal possi possible m lambda is n minus one, but inside v equal to d, the, this m lambda is at least n to the d. And uh, if you know representation theory, this corresponds to this. Oops, where you have d boxes below the first row. Yeah, sorry, uh, Young diagrams. Yeah, Young diagrams with d boxes below the first. Um, yeah, okay, so that's uh, the idea. 
So we know that if M lambda is large, then the eigenvalue is small. So basically we get that if we have a Kelly graph, an, ar an arbitrary dense Kelly graph, its eigenvalues behave like the eigenvalues of the noise operator. We get that the larger the degree is, the smaller the eigenvalue is. Because the larger the multiplicity is, the larger that, the smallest the eigenvalue is. So we get that this operator T that we defined earlier, um, so Tf was the expectation over A and A of Fa sigma. This operator, it uh, kills the high degrees. And then when you combine it with hyperconductivity and the level D inequality, you can get a uh, much better results. And that was our idea. And uh, yes, that's why we, so let's talk about uh, the methods. Okay, so this, yes, we already talked about uh, a lot. And okay, so here there are a few applications. Maybe I should talk about um, more applications. I don't know. So we have So a new application that uh, Doe didn't mean, mention is that uh, um, we have okay, so we have these applications to extremal problems and uh, recently we put one uh, on the archive uh, with OAD here um, and uh, soon Omri will come and uh, we'll also uh, <laughs> We also put a paper on the archive for extremal problems uh, using hyperconductivity for global functions and we basically proved uh, a sharp version hyperconductivity where um, optimal globalness implies that uh, you can think that uh, you get basically for the uh, Boolean hypercube. So provided that you have optimal globalness, you get uh, that this thing here is at most uh, the expectation of F squared divided by log one over the expectation of F divided by D, of that to the this power. And so those talk we talked about when when we get that this thing is at most epsilon times the, the two norm of f. But we can't have the technology to get everything that you have for the Boolean cube, you can get basically for the symmetric group, provided that you have globalness. So that's with um, um Martin Keller and uh, and Omri Marcus. And, and uh, yeah, so, so this, we did it for the product space. And then for SN, uh, we find a new way to reduce it without losing anything in the parameters. So this is with um, uh, Ellis. Symmetric group. We define this uh, coupling approach. This is, and we use this coupling approach 
already appeared in this work with uh, Yuval. And, and uh, guy. So we found this way to um, deduce hyperconductivity for, from to reduce hyperconductivity on the symmetric group, which is the non abelian setting, to the uh, n to the n, which can be thought of as an abelian group as z mod n to the n. Uh, but the original coupling approach had some loss in the parameters, and the follow up paper doesn't have loss in the parameters, and then we can get this inequality. And, and and then with uh, Abichai Marmo, we have we took basically our level D inequality and uh, our hypercontractive inequality and plugged in the characters of the symmetric group. That are, these are important functions of uh, uh, that, that have a certain degree associated to, uh, to them, and we. Uh, managed to give um, precise estimates to the Q norms of the irreducible characters. And these have a uh, Lot of applications to conical coefficients and, uh, and mixing times of conjugacy classes. And, to, and approximate uh, subgroups. Well, we want to show that uh, if you have a subset of the group such that a times a times a is small, then a is close to an actual subgroup. And uh, yeah. so we have the noise operator. This we talked about. And, okay, so I have. Ten minutes. Maybe maybe I'll just give the the things we talked about. Okay, so let's talk about um So let's talk about this coupling approach in Fn. Or maybe it's best just that uh, I'll, I'll talk just about the coupling approach, maybe not in SN, but in the P by setting, where this is the um, simplest range where you can apply it. So there's a method for getting hyperconductivity for a space for free without, um, without needing to do any calculations, instead you have to compute the eigenvalues of a certain operator. Instead of uh, computing the, the full norm of an operator, you get hyperconductivity for free. And in order to deduce something about, in, in order to, to deduce level D inequalities, you have to compute its eigenvalues. And uh, 
Okay, okay. And our goal will be to deduce. Conductivity in uh, in UP from hyperconductivity in U1. So it turns out that here you can actually deduce hyperconductivity uh, for free without doing any work. So let's explain how that works. And what you can do, you can define, you can think of a bipartite graph where in this side you have mu p and in the right hand side you have mu one half. And so all of them is have the vertices uh, of the Boolean cube. And you can define a coupling between them that should correspond to some weighted graph between them. But if you want, you can think here of, uh, instead of mu p, you can think of n choose p n. And here you can choose n, you can think of n divided by n over two. And now you'd like to define a random walk that correspond to starting with the set here and taking an arbitrary subset that contains it. And you also have a random walk in the other direction where we start, start with the set here and take an arbitrary subset of, uh, uh, you take a random uh, subset of it. So given, given A that's supposed, we should think of it as uniformly distributed, we can choose a random neighbor of A by um, by letting I not be in B whenever I is not in A. So we are going to choose B that's going to, and B is going to be contained in A. So whenever I is not in A, we also have a, I has to be not in B. And then we have the case where I is in A, and then we have to make B P biased. So when I is in A, we put I in B. With probability, um, and then we have to make sure that it's uh, going to be p-biased. So the only way that so we have to put it uh, is uh, um, 2p. So the only way that I could be in B is that if I is in A, and then the probability 2p, I'm going to be in B. So that makes B p-biased. So that's a coupling between the uniform distribution and the p-bias distribution. When you have a coupling, you can think of random walks that go from one side to the other. We have a coupling, uh, so we can define. So if you have a function um, f in L two of mu p, you can define an operator t, uh, t from L two of mu p to L two of mu one half, and you also have an operator t star in the reverse direction that corresponds to a random walk in the reverse uh, direction. Uh, 
the operator t is given by letting t f of um, a be the expectation over b random neighbor of a, a random neighbor of a according to this random walk of f of b. And T star corresponds to a random walk in the reverse direction. And it turns out that if you take a T star and compose it with the noise operator on the Boolean cube, T is the, the noise operator on the Boolean cube. Okay, so let's write it. Let's write this as T that goes from uh, P to one half. And other one, uh, so it's a joint that goes in the reverse direction. This is an operator from L2 of mu P to L2 of mu P. And what this operator does, it first takes you from mu P to the uniform measure. Then in the uniform measure, you apply the noise operator, and then you go back to the P bias measure. It turns out that if that, this thing is not a new operator. This is actually a noise operator with a different parameter. So that's one fact. If you take the composition of these operators to get this operator T of time, uh, that just belongs to the noise random. It corresponds to the um, noise random walk on the p bias cube that we defined earlier. And it turns out that this operator is hypercontractive uh, for free. So, um, so if T rho has this hypercontractive property that T rho 2 to Q is at most one, this means that um, T rho F Q is at most F2. All F. And then we get that Kiro prime as the same property. So rho prime is some uh, function of rho and p. So I didn't tell you like what's its definition, but it turns out that when you compose these operators, you get a different noise operator. And you can calculate this probability by following this uh, process. Because, and it's not a coincidence because the noise operator is the unique operator that uh, has this uh, independence between the coordinates. And uh, here, every, every coordinate, everything happened independently, so it must be some noise operator. Okay, that's theorem, and the proof is very simple. Yeah, so I have probably 30, 30 seconds, and I managed to give the proof in 30 seconds. The proof is to take this operator. Um, T rho prime, which is T star uh, T rho T. And when we look at T star T rho T of F Q norm, we can realize that T star is a contraction. Every operator that corresponds to a random walk is a, is a contraction, so we can get rid of this T star. Then we can upper bound it using hyperconductivity by T F Q norm, and then we can get rid of this T because T is also a contraction. So basically, you get hyperconductivity for free. And, uh, and that's how you can prove, deduce the hyperconductivity in the p-bias cube from hyperconductivity in the uniform cube. And it turns out that this method is really general, and you can apply it in the symmetry group to deduce stuff from the product space setting. And you can apply it uh, for matrices to deduce things from the a corresponding bilinear group, which is called the bilinear scheme. And, uh, and probably I should uh, soon stop, but I just wanted to put
Okay. So I wanted to put two messages out of the talk. So first of all, that um, that in A and uh, we get this uh, that the extremal product preset is a dictator. So these extremal problems appear also in additive combinatorics and group theory. And the other message of the talk is that you have this this hyperconductivity for global functions is a powerful tool uh, in probability and group theory and representation theory basically everywhere. So that's what uh, uh, so let's stop here. So any questions to Norm? So you'll get some noise operator and this noise operator is going to get yeah then you can get uh, you you can deduce global hyperconductivity from the slice to the pre-bias cube and then it will be more involved you'll have to show that this coupling operator preserves the globalness which it does in the case of sn so sn you uh, use this coupling to get it into n to the n and you see you show that the globalness is preserved and then you get hyperconductivity any more questions so, so I should think of the bridges as a coupling process. Yes. So we have a, so the coupling between mu p and mu one half, and this coupling you can think of as a weighted by parted graph because it gives you like a distribution. So you can think of it as a, a random edge in the graph. And then uh, for this weighted parted graph, we have a random walk it goes from one side to the other and back. And this random walk you have operators t and t star. That correspond to it. And these operators are automatically contractions because it's true for every random walk on a bipartite graph. And then when you decompose, when you uh, take the composition of these operators, you get automatically a hypercontractive operator. And here, you just have to realize that it's the noise operator. In general, you get, if you want to deduce hyperconductivity for the symmetry group, you'll get some weird operator on SN and you'd have to compute its eigenvalues to deduce something uh, meaningful. So it's not automatic. You'd have, you really have to do some. Uh, to use some representation theory in order to compute the eigenvalues of the operator that you get when you apply this process. Okay, so let's thank Norm again. So we'll return after lunch at 2 p.m.